Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to another educational series from International Dermatology Education Foundation. I am your host tonight. My name is Leon Kersig. I'm the president of International Dermatology Education Foundation and a clinical professor of dermatology at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. My private practice and clinical study center is in Louisville, Kentucky. Tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Marisa Joseph, and we will discuss odd therapy for eczema and beyond. However, before we do that, we have a couple of um, housekeeping. So, first, I'd like to thank our supporter, uh, Avino JNJ, for supporting this program tonight. And also, before we begin, if you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate if you can fill out this very short survey. If you're having technical issues or if you'd like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your question in the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, at the end of this uh, session, we will have a Q&A session. So please submit your questions using the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. So a couple of words and opening remarks from International Dermatology Education Foundation. International Dermatology Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. We have done several programs throughout North America, including Canada, as well as Latin America, Europe, Middle East, as well as Southeast Asia. So tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Marisa Joseph. She's an assistant professor at University of Toronto, as well as medical director, RKS Dermatology Center and Women's College Hospital with staff being a staff physician at the Hospital for Sick Children. So thank you very much for joining us, Marisa. Please come along and take it over. And she's gonna discuss odd therapy for eczema and beyond. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I really appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you on a topic um, that is very near to dear to my heart because I spend a lot of my clinical time thinking about what patients put on their skin. So when I first started in practice, um, it didn't matter what patient I saw, sort of hand on the door, uh, the number one question is, what should I be using? Almost regardless of the reason for the presenting complaint. And I have to say, you know, 14 years later, not much has changed. Um, the question always is, what should I be using on my skin? But the space in terms of who is offering um, that type of advice is, is quite crowded now. So we've got TikTok, we have skin influencers. And so I think it's important. It was always important, but more now than never, uh, than ever to sort of be aware of um, what are the recommendations that we make uh, for patient skin? And also, what's the evidence behind uh, some of the suggestions that we make? And so tonight, the focus is going to be oat therapy for eczema and beyond. I have a number of disclosures as I have a special interest in inflammatory skin conditions. And of course, we thank Avino for supporting this program. The learning objectives today are to identify the components and the multifaceted benefits of colloidal oatmeal and its effect on the moisture barrier, recognizing the clinical research highlighting the benefits of colloidal oatmeal in various skin conditions. So we're going to open up with a polling question. And so which of the following ingredients do you consider to be the most effective for the treatment of itchy, dry skin? Is it ceramides, oats, or both are equally effective? And it's interesting because 
you know, we'll get into this a little bit in the presentation, but, you know, there's the uh, consideration of the vehicle and the hydrating components, but then looking at the um, active ingredients and whether they uh, aid in improving the skin barrier, particularly dry skin. And so uh, we've got um, a bit of a split. So we've got ceramides, oats, um, it's getting the minority, and then both are equally effective taking the majority. So we'll, we'll um, dive into that a bit more. And so let's start by talking about the key protective functions of the uh, skin barrier. So we know that there's a moisture component, antioxidant, immune response, uh, photoprotection, and antimicrobial, all very important uh, functions of the, of the skin barrier. The skin barrier, of course, we, we tell our patients that your skin's on the outside and it's arguably your most important organ because it is your protection, um, but it is influenced by many factors. So there's age, genetics, environment, uh, external aggressors, um, comorbidities, the anatomic site, and your skincare routine, which is really, really important. So what are the uh, important components for effective barrier function? Well, we've got pH, uh, the lipid content and formation, and then water content as well. And what we put on our skin influences that significantly. If we think about the history of oats and skincare, it has a real foundation in history. And you know, a lot of the things that we do in the modern um, day has some historical context um, and benefits that have been seen over time. And so if we go back to 2000 BC, we think about oatmeal being used for skin and health and beauty to soothe and treat a variety of skin conditions. And then over time, uh, evolving in its use and um, being recognized by the FDA and Health Canada. Colloidal oatmeal is really important to talk about as a skin protectant because of its um, historical um, benefits uh, and the fact that it really is designated by the FDA and Health Canada as a, an effective ingredient that can temporarily protect and help to relieve minor skin irritation due to eczema. And eczema is such a huge burden in our uh, society. I think if we think about colloidal oatmeal as, an, as, an in, as a key ingredient, we have to think about other key ingredients that are skin protectants um, that are designated uh, by the FDA and Health Canada. So these would be things like dimethicone, petrolatum, mineral oil, colloidal oatmeal, glycerin, cod liver oil, lactic acid, and zinc oxide. But colloidal oatmeal, and this is really important, is the only single over-the-counter active ingredient that can claim to do what um, is important in the context of skin barrier dysfunction and eczema. So to temporarily protect and really help relieve the symptoms of eczema. So FDA and Health Canada. If we think about the composition of oat um, and its benefits, we can think about the polysaccharide constituents, the phenolic compounds that exert a strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect. Um, there's the proceramide activities, the skin pH buffering, and then um, vitamin E again with strong antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. So uh, really multifaceted um, benefits due to the oat composition. It's also important to think about um, this process. So this is an important um, uh, concept to talk about because you know patients will say, well, can I just take the bag of oatmeal out of the cupboard and put it on my skin? And you know, um, people are doing all sorts of interesting things um, and finding interesting recipes on the internet. But the truth is, the process of obtaining coat extract is quite complex. Um, so it needs to be separated and cleaned and dehulled, and um, the raw components are, are cut and ground, and um, and to end up with the sort of pure um, oat extract. Oat 
oat terminology is also important to to talk about. It's not just oat. Um, there's um, components to this um, purified oat that have um, uh, different properties that increase the benefits. So triple oats refers to all three of these elements together. So we have the oat oil, the colloidal oat, which is the flour, and then the avenanthramides as well, which can aid with the itchy skin. So colloidal oatmeal, sorry there, colloidal oatmeal is an important moisturizing ingredient and the hydration is a key factor in preserving the skin barrier. We talk about this with patients, it doesn't matter if patients are on systemic therapy, if they have moderate to severe eczema, moderate to severe psoriasis, we're always talking about hydration of the skin being an important part of skin healing. And so when colloidal oatmeal is mixed with water, there's this viscous solution that is a is produced and that occlusive water binding solution forms a protective film that helps to keep the skin hydrated and therefore help to replenish the barrier. pH buffering of the skin is very important, particularly as it relates to inflammatory skin diseases. We know that normal skin is typically more of an acidic pH and diseased skin is more alkaline. And so the buffering capacity of colloidal oatmeal restores the pH of damaged skin to within that normal acidic range. And um, that has um, important benefits in terms of um, microbial balance. And so a key, um, a key important role of oat function in the skin as it, when it's applied to the skin. It's also important to note that um, there's increased expression of uh, important skin barrier genes, and um, particularly as in promoting the skin barrier and anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and that expression is enhanced with the use of colloidal oatmeal. Whole oat oil is rich in essential lipids, and um, that's very important because these contain key mammalian cell membrane components, phospholipids, glycolipids, and sterols. And maintaining that, um, that essential lipid barrier promotes good barrier function. Oat lipids induce ceramide formation in skin cells. So, you know, we, we mentioned ceramides earlier in the presentation, and I think it's important to note, this is a key um, study showing that Aveeno oat oil increases endogenous ceramide production by 71% in seven days versus the control. And so these in vitro studies show that um, even in terms of the benefit of ceramides, this actually promotes endogenous ceramide production. Avanthanthramides uh, come from a colloidal oats and are also known as alkaloid phosphine polyphenols. And um, these have potent antioxidant effects and really help with skin irritation. And so when we look at the erythema reduction with oat fractions, we can see that compared to other um, uh, components, there's a much uh, more significant um, improvement in terms of erythema change per gram. Colloidal oat extracts reduce the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines from human keratinocytes. So again, this is looking at the anti-inflammatory um, function, particularly important in inflammatory skin conditions such as atopic dermatitis. So we can see um, in the untreated control, um, there is um, uh, a significant difference between that and the um, uh, extracts. Apologies here, there's a bit of a delay. So colloidal oat extracts inhibit the TNF alpha induced activation of NF kappa B in human keratinocytes. And so again, this is looking at this um, anti-inflammatory um, function.
you know, patients are always asking us about probiotics, you know, they want to use probiotics for everything. And this microbiome story is an evolving story, and I think it's going to be important over time. But we have to be careful about the advice um, that we give, and that is based on evidence. But what's interesting is that data suggests that oat acts as a prebiotic um, and really supporting the growth of commensal organisms in the skin, such as Staph epidermidis, um, and then crowding out um, pathogenic uh, such as Staph aureus. And so this concept as a prebiotic uh, is also an important story. And Ultimately, oats supports the uh, moisturization um, of the skin in the short and the long term. And I think that is really key as well, too. So we have that solution, that occlusive sort of barrier, that promotion of a more acidic pH, but the long term actions that give you a durability of the um, of the uh, improvements in the skin are the proceramide action, normalizing this keratinocyte differentiation and skin barrier homeostasis by promoting those um, uh, important um, uh, gene products, uh, pH modulation via increased lactic acid production from the skin my microbiome. So in multiple ways, you get a durability and more long-term benefit from the use of oats over time. In terms of mechanisms of action, um, colloidal oatmeal has various mechanisms and we talked about many of them and I think it's important to reiterate. So there's that moisture barrier increasing the transcription of those skin barrier and differentiation genes, which may aid in the treatment of inflammatory conditions, and that occlusive sort of barrier, um, which helps to replenish uh, the moisture in the skin, but also induce ceramide formation in the skin cells. The pH uh, modulation and that buffering capacity, remember it's restoring the pH to within the normal range. The anti-inflammatory effects uh, reduce the uh, release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then the evanthermides inhibiting um, key uh, inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory cascades. Then the antipyritic effect by inhibiting neurogenic inflammation and helping break the itch scratch cycle, soothing and calming the skin. You know, I, I was telling um, a mother today, you know, the poor child is scratching and scratching. And in the clinic, she just keeps saying, stop scratching. But you can't stop scratching. It's, um, it, it's such a profoundly disruptive symptom. And it's not something that it's mind over matter. And so um, to have products that parents can uh, apply to the skin to help soothe the skin and decrease uh, that paritis is, is, is very important. There's the antioxidant um, benefits, as we said, um, and delivering up to nine times the antioxidant powder, uh, power compared to just the colloidal oat alone. So again, that triple oat therapy being important. And then lastly, um, acting as a prebiotic. So this concept of supporting the growth of commensal microorganisms such as Staph epidermidis and crowding out bad things like Staph aureus to balance the skin's microbiome and improve atopic dermatitis symptoms, right? So let's shift to clinical insight. So what's the evidence that we have? Um, and it's nice when you see a robust um, clinical trial program that can demonstrate benefits um, of the therapeutic intervention over a, a, a nice cross-section of patients and, and make it relevant for our practice. So we're going to touch on um, a bit of these um, patient profiles. So we have adults with atopic dermatitis, babies with children and atopic dermatitis, babies and children with atopic dermatitis, uh, patients with just dry skin, patients with skin of color, and having that representation, which is um, historically um, underrepresented, is nice to see in a, in a trial program. Uh, patients with dry skin secondary to type 2 diabetes, patients with psoriasis, and um, 
very important um, increasing um, recognition of patients who are having side effects from their advanced uh, chemotherapeutic regimens and, um, and how to support their skin during their oncology treatments. So let's look at patients with dry skin. So we know that benefits of the avino oat ingredients um, in cirrhosis are really looking at the moisturizing capacity of the active lotion with its vehicle lotion in 30 mil, uh, women. So in this study, um, there was a difference between the um, active lotion versus the vehicle. So this is not just about the moisturizing benefit of the vehicle alone, that the active uh, ingredient uh, confers the benefit by a lot of those mechanisms that um, we've already highlighted. The active ingredients in a skin relief lotion are more beneficial to the skin than the vehicle lotion itself, and this is key. So in this particular study, at day 21, the improvements in scaling and dryness were significantly greater with the active colloidal oatmeal uh, uh, lotion than the vehicle control. So again, um, this is looking at the benefit of the active ingredient, uh, the oat extracts. Let's look at eczema or atopic dermatitis in babies and children. There's some interesting data here. So before we dive into that, we need to think about the differences in infant skin versus adult skin. And um, you know, we're always saying as pediatricians, children are not little adults. And um, that is amplified when we look at the neonatal and infancy period. So even though, um, infant skin is more hydrated than adult skin, the transepidermal water loss is, is um, uh, profound and actually can lose up to two times as fast. The cells are also smaller and more permeable, and there's a shorter pathway from the outside to the inside, basically. And so there are many, many differences between um, infant skin and um, adult skin. But again, just to highlight that there's, um, even though there's more water retention, um, there's higher uh, evaporation, more um, transepidermal water loss, and um, the skin is thinner as well. So uh, we have to think about absorption. So because we have to think about absorption, we're always cognizant of the prescriptions that we're writing. You know, there's a lot of corticosteroid phobia out there. How do we minimize uh, the use of steroids, particularly in our younger po patient population? You know, I always say I'm a dermatologist. I have no issues with using steroids. I match our topical steroids. I match the degree of the topical to the degree of the eczema, and I do not want to undertreat. That said, you know, we often want to think about minimizing uh, a child's exposure. Um, and then we recognize, again, that infants have thinner skin, and so we're always thinking about absorption. So um, if we can think about uh, making recommendations uh, for effective uh, moisturizers that have anti-inflammatory uh, effects, well, we, we try to minimize the number of flares, the duration of flares, and increase the time to the next significant flare that might require prescription treatment. So this study is looking at um, the uh, prescription barrier cream um, in signs and symptoms of eczema and itch, and so comparing this prescription barrier cream, so in some places, in the world, in Europe, you can actually prescribe um, an emollient in um, Canada as part of the uh, federal health plan. You can prescribe emollients, particularly to our indigenous population. And so, um, but that's the context. So having a study where you're uh, looking at a prescription emollient compared to the colloidal oatmeal. And, um, you know, that might be of interest because of cost, et cetera. Um, and so, this study highlights that 
um, the colloidal oatmeal is as effective as a prescription barrier cream. And so if cost is a factor, um, that might be uh, something to, to consider. And it's nice to show that it is as effective. Colloidal oatmeal lotion is associated with an excellent efficacy and tolerability profile as well in a large study of infants and children with eczema. So, you know, um, parents will often say, you know, the baby's fussy when we put a product on, they're worrying about um, whether whatever they're using is stinging or burning. And so uh, it's important to have um, data that we can reassure parents that um, what we're suggesting is um, is tolerable and so in this eight-week observational study conducted in Greece of 1600 patients aged two months to 16 years um, there was improvement in in all spheres um, in week four and eight and it was well tolerated Colloidal oatmeal is also associated with excellent efficacy and tolerated uh, in a profile in this um, study, as I said. And so there's a 78 and 84% of patients who felt that they needed to use less medication at week four and eight. So that goes back to my, uh, my previous comment about parents and wanting, you know, steroid sparing agents um, and trying to minimize the use of their prescriptions. And so they, the, the patients felt that they needed to use less medication and um, 88 to 90 percent of patients said that they would continue to use the cleanser and the cream after the second um, study visit at week eight and again both colloidal oatmeal products were well tolerated by 98 percent of patients so the conclusion is that the use of colloidal oatmeal wash cream and product regimen may improve the severity of eczema and reduce the use of the dreaded um, sort of uh, prescription medications in infants and children with eczema. So again, thoughtful uh, recommendations that show um, evidence of reduction of disease burden as opposed to, you know, just reading on the internet to put turmeric or everything else on the skin. It's actually quite interesting um, if you dive into it with patients, um, what they're using on their skin. These Often these parents are desperate and so um, everyone's an expert. And so if someone suggests it, they're willing to try it. And so nice to think about this evidence and to reassure them about efficacy and tolerability. Let's look at eczema in children uh, older than 12 uh, and adults. And so what's, um, what supports uh, oatmeal use? So um, so this is an important um, study, uh, and this is always an important endpoint that we think about. What is the burden of atopic dermatitis on, on patients, on families, and also on our healthcare system utilization. It's such a common condition. I often have kids that I'm following who we see them, but then they go to emerge on the weekend, they go to a walk-in clinic. Um, and so, uh, and it's all because there's just searching for an input and for um, improvement um, sort of over time. And so using an emollient for AD is associated with fewer primary care visits and reduced healthcare utilization. So this study was our study for 45,000 patients who used emollients and 10,000 patients age one year and older who were evaluated for the two years following the first diagnosis of dry skin and atopic eczema. The, there were fewer primary care visits and reduced healthcare utilization and reduced costs and reduced antimicrobial use and reduced uh, topical steroid use. And so this is a really nice comprehensive study showing that um, good disease control of atopic dermatitis is associated with a reduced build, uh, burden on the healthcare system. Using a phenocolloidal oatmeal lotion for a, an associate Sorry. Sorry, I'm frozen here just for a moment. I'm so sorry. Um, so yes, relating back to this study, um, a sub-analysis of the emollient group was performed between those using colloidal oat as first-line therapy and then those who used it later in their journey. And what was shown was that 
uh, earlier use of the Aveno oat resulted in lower costs for prescriptions, fewer repeat visits, lower per visit costs, and reduced overall eczema cost and burden. There was reduced antimicrobial use, which is really important for antibiotic stewardship, which is on the top of everyone's minds. You know, often when kids will um, access um, non-continuous emergent care, they might be prescribed antibiotics as well. And then reduced topical steroid use um, in, in patients as well. And so these are all important um, and positive endpoints. So then when we think about patients with skin of color, um, again, having representation and showing um, diversity in your clinical program is important because there are, similar to their differences in infant and children's skin compared to adult skin, um, there are structural and functional distinctions in skin of color as well too. So richly pigmented populations have more layers in the stratum corneum. There's more sensitivity to pH changes. The, the size of the melanosomes are larger and denser. There's a greater distribu distribution of melanosomes throughout the epidermis and an increased number of melanosomes and a greater rate of melanogenesis and higher melanin content. This is what is responsible for the disproportionate amount of dispigmentation that's associated uh, with post-inflammatory uh, sequelae. And so, um, the thinking about this is important in terms of um, seeking good disease control, right? Because if these patients are disproportionately affected by disfiguring um, dyschromias. In addition, we can look at um, the uh, hydration of the skin and differences across ethnicities. And what we see is that there's a higher transepidermal water loss and lower wa water content, making moisturization particularly important for black patients. Um, and we can see the, the spread here um, in terms of the differences in transepidermal water loss, water content, ceramide levels, and skin reactivity. Colloidal oatmeal um, provided rapid improvement in atopic dermatitis symptoms and performed at least as well as a prescription cream in patients with skin of color. So this is the, uh, this was a sub-analysis of a larger trial looking at the efficacy and safety of colloidal oatmeal. And so this was um, 49 uh, black children aged from two to 15 with mild to moderate AD who used the product two times a day for three weeks. And uh, what we can see is that um, compared to the prescription barrier cream, um, it was just as um, good. So thinking about skin health practices. So, you know, this is um, a, a young child, very young child under the age of three in my practice who has uh, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And um, this patient happens to have Fitzpatrick's um, uh, skin type five, uh, is a black patient, um, but has very significant chronic inflammation and lichenification. And so this patient was referred to me as dry skin. And I always like to put a, a photograph like this up to sort of highlight how this is not just dry skin. Um, she actually has very little uh, uninvolved skin. We can see that there's hypo, hypopigmentation, hyperpigmentation, that rugation and um, lichenification or increased skin markings over the extensor surfaces, um, which we sometimes see uh, more in patients with skin of color as opposed to the popliteal fossa. Um, but this is a child with very severe eczema. And so I think it's important to think about um, these differences in presentation. So we think about the differences in the skin um, properties in age and across ethnicities, but also thinking about the differences in the way uh, that inflammation can present in the skin. And so um, looking at a patient like this, they require um, significant advice in terms of how to take care of their skin long-term, also in, in conjunction with the treatment of their underlying skin disease. So if we think about 
skin-directed um, therapy for atopic dermatitis. We know that there are factors of prevention, and that story is a fairly easy story to, to tell to parents. So avoidance of irritants, looking at the environment, proper clothing choices of avoiding um, uh, irritating fabrics, proper bathing and skin care. And so I think where things become more tricky is there's lots of competing evidence, um, or sorry, a lots of competing opinions for these poor families to try to think about uh, what to do for the skin. And they, they just need good advice, good evidence-based advice about what they should be doing. And so the recommendations are frequent, short, lukewarm uh, baths, uh, emollients after baths, and considering doing that two times a day, and then using um, the prescription plans as uh, outlined. And in my practice, patients usually get um, two types of treatment. So they get rescue treatment um, for, for significant flares and they're encouraged to treat early. And then uh, what we call maintenance treatment. And that can be different for different patients. It might be a milder um, sort of prescription for fly, flares that are not as significant or even the regular use of a milder um, topical prescription a couple times a week to, to particular areas that often are hot spots that will flare frequently, um, or using a combination of the two, using a stronger um, rescue therapy to turn down the temperature of the eczema, as I like to describe it to patients, and then carry on to completion with something that's a little bit um, milder. So skin-directed care for atopic dermatitis is an important story across all um, uh, levels of severity, whether it's the mildest patients to the patients that require systemic therapy, such as um, a traditional um, uh, immunosuppressant or a biologic. Sorry, I've got a bit of a delay here. So when we look at patients with um, atopic dermatitis, particularly pediatric patients, we, we think about them holistically. And I like to use that word a lot with parents that I see. I'm thinking about your child holistically. And this is not just a skin condition. We're gonna talk a lot about uh, maintaining the skin barrier, skin care being the cardinal um, important um, part of the treatment plan, but also looking at um, overall management. And I think that's important as we start to delve into conversations about food allergy and uh, avoidance and, um, and some of the myths that often will be associated uh, with the management of atopic dermatitis. And so um, this is the publication we did in 2019. It's, um, I think, still topical now in 2023, and really it's consensus statements on the uh, management of pediatric AD. And so just to end with some um, clinical insights in terms of uh, management as we make these recommendations for skin care, um, we should always be thinking outside the skin when we see these children and assess parietal sleep and impact on daily activities at every visit. Um, I don't use scoring tools on a regular basis. I think really it's just asking, how are they sleeping? How are they doing in school? And what are those impacts? Because uh, it's important to determine whether or not these patients may benefit from more advanced therapy. In addition, um, non-atopic comorbidities such as anxiety and depression and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder may be overrepresented in pediatric patients with AD. And that's really all goes back to the degree of paritis and uh, a lack of restorative sleep. Um, and so we emphasize that with parents. I think it's an important part of the conversation and this disruption in sleep, but it all goes back to what parents like to look for, the root cause, uh, which is this inflammation and itch in the skin. So again, we go back to the very beginning of um, what we talked about in this presentation, that skin care is just so essential because it can help to minimize the paritis as well as um, help um, with uh, inflammation and ultimately um, 
aid with good um, skin management and control and reduce the burden of the AD in these non-skin uh, ways. Uh, and just to emphasize that point, that this regular emollient use is part of the basic care for all patients uh, with AD. And similar to that study I presented earlier, the sooner you start using something, um, you reduce the, the likelihood of um, flares. Um, I, it's probably beyond the scope of this presentation, but this uh, early initiation in high infants, that's a very controversial, in very young infants is a very controversial um, uh, concept because there have been some conflicting studies, but ultimately our gestalt is really um, put water on the baby and moisturize them. And at least we have data um, supporting that um, these oat therapy is safe in this patient population and well tolerated. And, um, and again, sealing in the moisture with a daily bath and uh, bleach baths and wet wraps. I always like to mention these in, in conversations around managing the skin. I think they be, can, can be considered in some cases, but certainly would not be something um, that we would use in all patients. And so when we think about the role of emollients in repairing the skin barrier, and we, we've talked a bit about atopic dermatitis as being an example of um, uh, a condition that results from an impairment in the skin barrier, the emollients need to do several things. They need to create a partially occlusive barrier between the skin and the air and reduce transepidermal water loss. They need to allow the skin to rehydrate by the diffusion of water from deeper skin layers. You know, parents are always asking me about the absorption of the moisturizers. And I always say, no, you just need a layer to give the skin time to absorb um, the water, to have the potential to protect the skin from the external environment. And again, ultimately all to lead to the goal of restoring that skin barrier and soothing the dry and eczema prone skin. You know, eczema, or atopic dermatitis is um, such a lovely condition to apply analogies to. So whether you talk about a cracked riverbed or a hard cell suitcase or a suit of armor, there's a lot of um, sort of good metaphors that we can use to describe to patients to emphasize why um, uh, hydration and emollients ultimately in repairing the skin barrier is so essential. And so, you know, I always say to my residents, the top three reasons why, um, you know, a patient is not getting better with a prescription uh, anti-inflammatory cream is they're not using the cream, they're not using the cream, and they're not using the cream. Um, and so adherence continues to be a big, big challenge. And, and you know, there could be many reasons for that. Um, it can be corticosteroid phobia. It can be just the fatigue of having to put it on. It can be the power struggles, uh, particularly in pediatric patients um, in terms of, um, you know, trying to uh, stay with the routine and the children sort of bucking against that. Um, but emollients are soothing. And, you know, there's no baggage in terms of corticosteroids associated with it. And so adherence to emollient treatment is really the key to successful therapy. And we need to pick what parent, patients and um, parents are willing to use. And so having data that suggests tolerability and safety and efficacy is really important. And patients should be able to choose their emollients according to cosmetic acceptance. And so in summary, um, the benefits of oats and skincare have been acknowledged for over 2000 years. And research has demonstrated that colloidal oatmeal components have the following properties. So in vitro, they're immunostimulatory, um, promoting those good um, sort of um, key keratinocyte differentiating, differenti differentiation, sorry, um, genes antioxidant, um, anti-ultraviolet, they induce ceramide formation, they're anti-inflammatory, anti-irritant, and water binding. Can you find and and then, Greg 
apologies, then in vivo, soothing, moisturizing, barrier protecting, gentle cleansing, pH buffering, and reducing inflammation with anti-irritant properties. And so Johnson & Johnson have harnessed these myriad of benefits in the colloidal oatmeal-based skincare products, the product of which is highly specialized and regulated. So can't just take the oats from your um, from, sh from the shelf and sort of apply it to the skin. So in summary, we've talked about the multifaceted benefits of oats for skin health, anti-inflammatory properties and beneficial pH modulation, and the fact that it boosts endogenous ceramide production for that durability of response long-term, and of course the immediate short-term effects. There's a vast, robust uh, clinical study program, and we've emphasized that vehicle control studies show that it improves cirrhosis even more than just a vehicle alone. There's um, whole system benefits in terms of fewer primary care visits and reduced healthcare utilization. And we've also looked at it in special populations such as children with pediatric uh, atopic dermatitis and um, patients with skin of color as well in AD. And we want to remember that oat is the only single over-the-counter active ingredient that can claim to temporarily protect and help relieve symptoms of eczema as recognized by the US FDA and Health Canada monographs. And emollient use is a key component of the management of atopic dermatitis, regardless of the severity of the AD. And so we're going to end on a polling question. And so our polling question here is, has this scientific presentation changed your perception on the skin benefits of oat? So yes, no, I already knew the benefits of oat, or no, not yet. And again, um, I love doing uh, sessions like this, presentations like this, attending presentations like this, um, because it's important to think about the prescription um, therapeutic interventions and the evidence, but a, a big part of our story, a big part of the patient journey is what they put on their skin and, um, and what's the evidence behind it. And I think the more and more we learn we or explore this, we learn um, uh, how important it is and what, what the beneficial um, ingredients are. And so we have a, a good poll uh, with uh, many of you uh, already knowing the benefits of oat, uh, but generally recognizing um, that there really is a benefit with oat therapy. And so with that, I thank you so much for your attention and um, I really enjoy um, connecting with you on this topic, and uh, I look forward to any questions you may have. Well, Dr. Joseph, that was an amazing lecture. That was very eye-opening on the oatmeal and, I mean, <laughs> oatmeal, colloidal oat and the role of the colloidal oat in the epidermal barrier function. And apparently, you did change a lot of people's mind. 70% said yes, right? Uh, so that's a huge, huge progress. So thank you so much. We have some time and we have a couple of questions. Um, what is the one question is, what is the mechanism of action of the oat? I'm sure you mentioned it, but I think there is still some um, uh, importance to it if you can elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I think um, it's important to think about the in vitro and in vivo studies. And um, so there's different spheres, right? Um, so number one, um, that there's a promotion of these important regulatory genes in the skin that promote keratinocyte differentiation. And so orderly um, arrangement of the keratinocytes and their um, ability to retain water in the skin. There's also the proceramide formation. And so we talked about the lipid content of the skin being important to maintain the integrity of that barrier. And so um, through uh, the, the different um, extracts and different ways in form, forming that triple oat um, complex, um, it's able to achieve that. Then also the importance of that pH uh, Right? So restoring, so we know that uh, restoring the skin to more of an acidic pH is um, 
uh, promotes a healthy microbiome um, and overall uh, good skin function. So it's really multifaceted in terms of the mechanism of how it does that, um, but there's lots of good in, in vitro uh, mechanistic studies to, to reveal that. Just leading to that, uh, what makes the oat therapy unique and different from the other emollients? Well, I think um, what's nice is some of these studies that show that um, when you look at vehicle alone, even just the vehicle of the um, oat lotion, um, there is a benefit. So this isn't just about the occlusive, uh, the humectant or occlusive property of the vehicle itself. And so that's a key differentiator, I think, for me, because, you know, a lot of times you just put something on the skin, you know, it's going to help and it may hydrate, but that's a short-term benefit. And I think what we're looking for is the durability of the benefit. I'm sure many of us have patients who say, I put the cream on and within an hour I'm dry again and I need to do something else and so that's an increased burden on the patient um, makes it difficult to be adherent to moisturization and so I think that's an important differentiator in terms of that durability and long-term benefit uh, with the response as well. You know actually it's very commendable that Avino did a study extracting the uh, colloidal oat from the cream itself and just use the vehicle versus the, yeah. the whole thing right because um, most of the studies in this world, in this arena, on the emollients, it's usually the open label, no vehicle controlled study. So it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. This is really key. I think this is a really key message because um, it's it's not just about the vehicle alone. It's that this active ingredient actually has some uh, important uh, benefits mechanistically. Yeah, it's amazing that they did that. It's very commendable. Um, I have another question about allergies. It's interesting. Have you ever seen allergies to colloidal oat? I have not in my practice. And, you know, it's, um, and that's what's nice. And, you know, anecdotally, it's sort of reassuring. You know, there are certain products you might get a lot of phone calls about. This is irritating, that's irritating, or um, always worried about contact allergy as a, uh, in particular as well, too. Patients are... Um, you know, this concept of oat is is very attractive to patients. Um, and But they also use other things. They use um, other types of oils and lavender and turmeric and all sorts of things. And um, we, I commonly see people who are developing what seems to be like a superimposed contact allergy on top of what they're using. But I actually haven't seen that um, with um, a vino or oat oil product. I'm interested, yeah, have I, you? I have not either. Ironically, I have not either. Um, it would be actually interesting to know if there are any reported cases, uh, but I have not. Um, another question is, um, how do you recommend your patients to apply twice a day, three times a day, before or after the treatments, or uh, before or after the uh, prescription treatments? That's a very good question. I think. Uh, well, as a quick aside to that, to answer that question, you know, sometimes patients will come in and with these complicated regimens where they were told to put the medicine on, wait 15 minutes, then put a cream on, that sort of thing. I don't do any of that. I want, I want it all to go on. I want them to get it done and, and do anything we can to facilitate adherence. Um, generally, by the time someone sees me, I recommend twice a day. Um, uh, moisturization and um, and that might be with wetting the skin first I try to encourage them to wet the skin first or in babies who are very significantly affected with multiple diaper changes to sort of wet the skin um, and in general we tell people to put medicine on first don't mix the med prescription medicine with the moisturizer and then put it on. Put the medicine on first, then in the areas that are required, then put moisturizer everywhere. We reassure them that they don't have to be super clinical with a paintbrush to put on the topical only on the spots. It's okay to smear a little bit elsewhere. Um, although it's interesting, um, there is, you know, what, there have been studies done looking at uh, particular particular prescriptions in vehicles and whether or not it matters whether you put it on first or after and it may not make a difference but I think that's getting super granular and not really um, 
probably in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter for your average patient who's coming in. Medicine first, the moisturizer on top, and BID to just try to make it um, uh, so consistent. In, uh, ironically, I did that study and it really did not make a difference if you put the moisturizer first and then the medicine or vice versa yeah efficacy wise however if the it's a if the prescription medicine is an irritating one it really helps to put the moisturizer first and then the medicine and sometimes yeah. i do that for acne patients when they are using topical retinoids that irritates them uh, and that makes a big difference but inherently we have innately you know we learned that first put the medicine then put the moisturizer but uh we yeah. did that Study. So, you did do that study, yeah. It's yeah. interesting, and I think it's nice to to sort of have that because we we sort of start with medicine first, but and then we sort of backtrack and manage if there's an issue. Although with topical calcineurin inhibitors, I tend to start off right from the start, saying if it stings the first couple of times, yeah. then go ahead and and do this sort of sandwich method and see if you can persist. Right. It's it's very interesting how we learn things later on. Well, I thank you so much. That was amazing. And it was a very eye-opening session. I learned a lot and hopefully all our attendee, attendees learned a lot. I thank you so much. Um, so I also thank our supporters one more time, uh, Avino and J uh, and J. And I'd like to invite you for our next session with Dr. Sonia Abdullah. And we will discuss the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. And that's on June the 7th, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.